Welcome to a panel discussion called Web It Up. And I'm Elliot Margulies. I'm with the Mid Peninsula Community Media Center. Now, there's a couple of things all of us in this room and all of us uh, on this illustrious panel we have in common, and that is we make videos and we want people to see them. And almost all of us, probably all of us, are using uh, public access the Media Center to make some of our videos, use some of the equipment. This very studio that we're sitting in is an example of using uh, community production materials, resources that we provide. And we, we started in 1990, but uh, public access got started in 1970 when community media activists throughout the country were fighting for a channel in each of their communities that could belong to the public and be free of commercials, but be available to free expression. Well, we used that venue, those cable TV channels, for many, many years for our videos. And then in the 90s, the internet emerged, and everything was changed. The whole world is kind of upside down from where it was before the internet in terms of media. So tonight, we're going to explore the ways that we leverage the internet and, and help, it, help it serve us, get more people to see the videos that we make. I'm just going to set the scene with a few statistics. Maybe, Henrietta, you can help me with this one. How many would you say, how many Americans today check the internet on a daily basis? OK, give me a percent. <laughs> I know you don't have a microphone, so I'll repeat. She said millions. How many percent do you think? At least 40 percent. At least 40 percent, she's right. It's two-thirds, 67 percent. Check it daily. And social media sites like Facebook, that's an even newer emerging platform. 65 percent of all those online check that regularly. And it's even higher for video sharing sites. It's 71% that now use a video sharing site. What do I mean by video sharing site? Anybody? YouTube. YouTube, <laughs> yeah, and, and many yeah. others. But uh, you know, imagine here we were plugging away, putting on our videos on a single community channel, community by community. And you wake up one morning, it's 2005, and there's this whole new YouTube phenomenon. And, and right now, uh, I know nobody has a mic. So how many think that over a million people a day upload to uh, or view YouTube? Over a million a day. How about 800 million different viewers per month, different people, uh, watch YouTube videos? That's what it's up to. There's 72 hours worth of video uploaded every minute on YouTube. And YouTube's just one of hundreds of video repositories online. So I am going to turn over some of the uh, questions and answers to our illustrious panel. I want to tell you who their names, who they are. And then after I tell you who they are, I want to poll you a little bit on questions so they know which, what kind of information you're mostly excited to get. And maybe we'll make a, a video that other community media people from our, our community as well as communities around the country can check out. Because we're learning as we go. And we're going to share information from you too, not just the people up here. But uh, I want to introduce on my right, your left if you're viewing, Karen Owak, who is a uh, producer, uh, well, a longtime sports producer and also health producer, but she's starting a new series of shorts on, uh, on our facility, using our facility called uh, The Health Style. And next to her is DC Cassandra. DC makes short films, and he'd been making short films before ever using community access facilities and putting them at, into film festivals. And uh, I got to see one of his. It's, it's phenomenal. 
and we'll hear more about how he gets people viewing short films online. Um, next to him is Birgit Starmans, and she's a producer here with the Toastmasters show. And in her working life, she's the senior director of marketing for SAP. And she's also a public relations officer for uh, Toastmasters District 4. And then next to her is David Falver. And he's the co-producer of a series called, uh, it's, called your it's called Types, Your Personality Revealed. And it's about the Enneagram. And right now, he told me that it's the number two uh, video that gets watched or, and uh, is, is comes up when you search for Enneagram videos on YouTube. So it's a pretty phenomenal accomplishment. We'll hear more about how they got so elevated. And number five is Martin Wasserman. And Martin's been a longtime producer uh, using community media on a whole range of issues and his, his newest series is called Tech Talk that he does in conjunction with the tech Future Talk. Future Talk. Uh, I'm so sorry. Future <laughs> Talk that he does in conjunction with the Tech Museum in San Jose and has it airing on community media channels around the country. So now I want to poll you for just a, a minute or so about some of the questions we thought you'd care about. But show me a uh, with your hands raised how much you want to know about this particular thing. Um, number one, what, what kind of content seems to get the most views online? Show of hands? OK, about half of you. What about where to post online? Preferences about where to post? A little over half, 2 thirds. Now, once you get it online, getting people over to see it. How about that? <laughs> I'm glad, because I thought that was the main theme tonight, and now I know I'm in the right place. Um, and now, um, what about using social media, like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, to leverage the viewership of your videos online? So that's oh, about half again, no, two thirds. And then, what about making money uh, with your videos online? <laughs> And that's, that's like two-thirds. <laughs> OK, interesting. And, and then what about uh, getting more channels like ours in Palo Alto area to carry your videos? And that's about two. So all of those were kind of important for tonight. Um, let me just throw it out there. Who's going to bring the mic around to the audience? Patty is. If any of you once has a burning question that you know you, you want us to cover tonight, uh, it'll come up in the Q&A. But if we know that a bunch of you want it, if you think a bunch of you are going to want it, stand up now and say what it is, just real quickly. All right, you're happy with the ones I threw out there? OK, if you think of other ones or you want some more clarity on something, you can raise your hand. Patty will come over to you. And we'll dig deeper into what some of our guests say. So without further ado, I want to uh, let Karen start and say a little bit about her, her video work and what she's doing online with it. OK. I'm Karen Nowak, and I host, write, and produce the Health Reporter and the Health Reporter Minute. And, and I'm an, a clinical exercise physiologist, and I decided to bring television to my field work, which is in health. And uh, we're also in production with uh, the Media Center on a new half hour show called Health Style, which is a health and lifestyle show. Uh, right now, the Health Reporter is online. It's, it's on my blog, which is thehealthreporter.tv. And we also, um, it's also on Peg Media. And we use that a lot uh, to get it seen nationally on television there. There's the health reporter. <laughs> That's my blog. And I put my, my videos on that blog. It's, it's archived there, as well as I'll feature a particular uh, uh, video on, uh, on, on the blog, which also kind of 
finds its way to LinkedIn, to Twitter, and Facebook, and some other social media outlets. Okay, and DC? And then, so if you want to know more about how she does it, that'll come up in our Q&A. Go ahead, DC. Uh, my name is DC Kassandra. I'm a writer-director at Dead Set Films, which is my own uh, personal brand for my filmmaking. And a lot of what I do is try to bring viewers to my short films. And a lot of that is very difficult. You know, the web is a, is a wonderful, terrible thing because there's, a, like you said, I think, what did you, like 28 billion new videos are uploaded to YouTube every day and trying to attract audiences to see your film is very difficult. So I work on a lot of social media uh, to bring viewers when we're promoting for a film festival or just promoting a film online. I also talk with a lot of other filmmakers across the country and some in several other countries to see what works, what doesn't work. Such a dynamic you know, landscape that's just changing all the time and you know, sometimes somebody will find something that works and we feel Americans go, oh okay, here's this great idea, you know, let's all do this and then you know, two days later that, that method will stop working. You know? So it's, uh, it's very fast changing and I think all filmmakers are really trying to you know, catch up to see how we can bring people to watch our films. And Birgit? Hi, my name is Birgit Starmans. I'm one of three co-producers for Toastmasters Beta Bay, along with Stan Ng and Dennett Lewis. And the purpose of Toastmasters Beta Bay is to provide kind of a public service uh, to, to the community to help show them what Toastmasters is all about. So it serves the purpose of showing how speaking skills can be improved through Toastmasters. And it also serves a public relations purpose to allow uh, people to find out about us. And then finally, it gives our members the opportunity to actually get the experience of speaking on TV. Because in Toastmasters, you're usually in a meeting in a closed room, and you don't have to deal with three different cameras and lights shining on you. So a lot of the members find it a very valuable experience to be on the show. Now, I was the public relations officer for District 4, which covers San Francisco down to Monterey from the end of 2008 to 2011. Uh, I've kept the co-production of the show, luckily. Uh, but during that time, I actually created our Facebook presence, our Twitter presence, our LinkedIn presence for District 4. So that's something where we publish, and we've noticed that uh, we are getting a lot more hits on our sites and our videos ever since, that we're, ever since we started using s social media. We also have a home page, which is our core for Toastmasters District 4, d4tm.org, where we drive everyone back to. So we have all of our various shows that are linked in there. When we first started out, it was Blip TV, and now it's actually YouTube. So it's nice to have one page on our website that no matter where we hosted it during time, uh, we can always link back to those things. And then additionally, I'm a blogger on the Mountain View patch, and there I write about public speaking, which is also a good mechanism to point back to our videos and point back to our shows to create more interest. David? Uh, my name is David, and my background is in uh, psychology and specifically in personality typing and profiling. Um, my partner, uh, Catherine, uh, has a, a similar background, and we uh, teach the Enneagram, which is a personality typing uh, system that's internationally very popular. So we started doing a one-hour show uh, here at the Media Center, and we've been doing it for about a year and a half, and the keys for us were, okay, we have this show, um, the rules of the Media Center are I can't sell it on a DVD, we already sell a lot of different products. So how do I really get it out there? And uh, we also, like many people here, we have a big Facebook presence and Twitter and LinkedIn and we're actually big into Pinterest right now. Um, but YouTube has been uh, far and away obviously our big video distribution. and. Um, I think we'll go into it, but that has been a, a, a long-term process in terms of how to get the rankings on YouTube. Um, we're in a very specific niche, um, so that has its advantages and disadvantages. But it's, so far, it's been, it's been very successful. We're, we're about right across about 80,000 views um, in about two years, so uh, we're doing pretty good. And Marty. I'm Martin Wasserman, and I'm producer and host of Future Talk, and it's all about understanding the global impact of technology, both for good and for bad, and trying to see where the new technology is leading us. Now, we do a number of things on the internet to promote the show. We're on Peg Media, 
We're on YouTube. We're on Blip TV. We have a website. We have a blog. We're on Facebook. But the thing that's been most successful for us is Peg Media. Peg Media is a video sharing website specifically designed for local access stations. Producers upload their shows and then the stations can download whatever shows they want and put them on the air. So our shows have been downloaded over 2,500 times by about 200 stations in 36 different U.S. states. We've also got two international channels, including a satellite channel in England that claims to reach 10 million households. And I'll be happy to discuss how to get on PEG Media and toss out some ideas about how to increase your downloads once you're on it in the Q&A. So I'm going to kick it off with a question that might, might pull together a number of the, the elements of success. If, and you don't all have to answer this, but if there's a video that you've put online or, a vid or even a, several videos that seem to get the most hits, what would you say are the secret ingredients? What's that recipe that got you more hits for that particular video than any of your other ones? Does anybody want to start on that? I can, okay. I can start on that. Yeah. It goes back to integrating social media as, as part of our whole strategy. And then also encouraging the people that are on the show to also share. It's one thing if you have a page, it takes a while to establish a following for a Facebook page. But we went with the, with the idea of doing a page and not a group, because that way anybody can just like the page. A group you need to administer and add members and things like that. The other thing is encouraging speakers who are on the show to also share, because that way you grow your fan base. So that's something that's really worked. It's not just the D4TM presence on Facebook or on the website. It's getting people to share maybe posting it on their particular pages. And then their friends see that, and that way we get more of a fan base. So that's really exponentially increased what we do. Also moving from Blip to YouTube was huge for us. And then finally, embedding the, website, the, the current video on our website on the home page. So in addition to having that one page where we have all of our episodes, uh, we embed it right there on the home page. So when people who might not know about Toastmasters or maybe members who weren't aware of the show, we have 5,000 members in this area, uh, they will see it, they'll click on it, and we've gotten a lot of interest both in speaking and, and in sharing that, those videos. So that's been key for us. Thank you. Who else has got a success story that they've analyzed, they've dissected? David. Sure. Uh, what helped us the most was I, I initially thought we'd be getting all of the views through embedding the videos on our website. Our website does quite well. Um, but what we found was that the views on YouTube were, were much greater but that it was, we had to pay a lot of attention to the way that we were tagging and describing the videos and titling the videos on YouTube was critical to getting organic ranking on YouTube. Um, and initially, we were making a lot of errors in that, and they were not errors that you would think were errors. So we worked with uh, a pretty high-paid consultant who was a friend of mine, so luckily I didn't have to pay him. And I also attended um, some different conferences like SES, Search Engine Summit. Um, and I think we'll explore some of that a little bit more later. Thank you. And, and Martin, go ahead. Yeah. I think when we talk about getting more people to view the show, there are two different aspects to it. There is getting people's initial interest and getting them to keep coming back again. And one of the ways to get initial interest is to have a cachy title for the program. So for example, on PEG Media, they now have about 700 different programs, and they're all listed on one page just by title. Now, if you're a program manager and you're looking for a couple of new programs to fill out your schedule, you don't want to click on 700 names and read all of those descriptions. You want a title that stands out. So, for example, Future Talk is not a bad title because it contains the word future, and a lot of people are interested in the future and might be curious about what you know a show like that uh, you know, might really talk about. If your show is a, of a specific type, for example, it's a music show or a sports show or a health or a fitness show, something in the title should reflect that. So in case a program director says, well, we don't have enough fitness shows, we need another fitness show, he'll be able to recognize your show as being in that category. Uh, what you probably don't want to have is something like 
you know, the Joe Smith show because that doesn't really say anything about the show. Uh, you should use very specific buzzwords to grab interest and attention right away. And the subject of how to get people coming back is another whole talk, which maybe we'll get to later if we have time. Okay. And DC. Yeah, I think the one thing I would say is, you know, be unique. You know, have something unique because I think there's there's so much content that if you know if you watch a show like Future Talk and go, oh, I love Future Talk, I want to make my own Future Talk. Well, what distinguishes you from those you know other shows you're competing with? You have to have something unique. You know. Future talk in the nude, for instance, you know, <laughs> something that sets you apart. Because I think when people are, are sort of walking through it and look, you know, they have so much content to pick from, they want to see something unique. They're not, they're not looking for the same stuff that's been done a hundred times. And I, I see that a lot with short film where people go, oh, I really like that movie and I made my own version of that movie and there's nothing new to set it apart. There's nothing that's going to draw people. But if you can find a unique angle, you can get people in. And then you know you became you, you sort of make a name for yourself for creating new original content, and that's what people want to find. They want to see something new that they haven't seen. Now it's possible that adding in the nude to any title <laughs> uh, might boost your views. The health reporter in so. the nude. Yeah, the health reporter in the nude. I, you got me. Yeah. Show I, us the goods. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to add that I use the forum on Peg Media a lot, and so when I have a new segment that's coming out. I'll announce it in the forum. And so people that are already following or, or are, are not familiar with it, they'll say, oh, a new, new, the new health reporter segment is, is out. I have a little bit of a different approach because my, seg my health reporter segments are a minute or to three minutes. So they've become very popular because of the fact they're so short. And the, the stations pick them up because they can f use it as a, an avail which is uh, and plug it in wherever they need to fill a spot. So that's worked really well for me. And brevity is probably the way most of us use video online. I have a short story regarding, uh, we can file it under brevity, we can file it under titling and serendipity. And that is, uh, we do a lot of, the media center will go out and videotape different talks in the community, and probably a number of producers here do that too. Well, to get people to buzz about it, I'll find like two or three radical statements in whatever the person presented, two or three of the most noteworthy statements that might raise your eyebrow, and, um, and, and put those online as separate little clips. And I did that for somebody who was talking about affordable housing. The talk was maybe an hour. And uh, so I put up three different clips. And I looked back at it like about 10 days later. And one of the clips had gotten uh, 100 or 200 views. And another one, 100 or 200. And the third one had gotten 2,500 or 3,000. Way, way more. And I thought, what did I do right on the one? And I looked at the titles. And there was the answer. Um, one of them, you know, was something about density and for affordable housing, and one was uh, about government uh, attitudes toward affordable housing. The third one was simply take the affordable housing quiz. Bingo. Well, as soon as I had a game element to the title, all of a sudden there were 3,000. I should mention that. I publicized it to all the affordable housing nonprofits who send it out to their members and stuff. But that was the one that got the traction. So mm -hmm. just another thing to, to bear in mind is that the title really does make a difference. Yeah. So I'm going to pick up on something uh, Brigitte said. She switched to blip from Blip TV to to YouTube, and I, I remember that one of the things you were interested in as an audience was where to post your videos. So I would like the folks in, on the panel, and perhaps a couple of you, to very briefly say what, what you found were the best attributes of a place where you decided to put your videos. Why have you chosen to concentrate on one place over another? So who's got something to say about that? Brigitte, you want to give us a more sure. detailed answer about Flip to YouTube and kick us off? Sure. And what 
triggered us moving from one to the other was actually that we suddenly had an account where we could upload more than 15 minutes. Because for a long time, that was, that was a major limitation for us. Now, we are not as specific, because when people look for Toastmasters, everybody and their brother is posting about Toastmasters, public speaking, et cetera. But we're still getting more traction from being on YouTube, because uh, some of the technological advances, you can actually scroll ahead faster. Um, it takes less time to cache some of that information, so that's something that's really helped us. And that whole idea of embedding in other places. And so uh, going back to, for example, the blog that I write or our website, being able to embed that and that you're still counting the views on YouTube and you can still scroll ahead, but it's just so much more ubiquitous. Everybody's familiar with it as opposed to some of the other services that you know, just people outside of maybe the, the TV industry might not know about. The blips and the Vimeos have their place. But I think when people think about videos these days, it really is about YouTube. And actually, the search engine optimization for, for YouTube, I, I agree that's huge. But that's the, the same is true of websites and blogs also, because you're always tagging things. So it's not just limited to YouTube. I think that optimization can be done in a lot of different places. Right. I think YouTube is sort of ubiquitous. I think when people are looking for some sort of online content, YouTube is probably one of the first places they go and yep. do a search. And David, also the, you, you uh, said, I'm sorry, Birgit, uh, do you want to finish that? No, just uh, YouTube, the, the other nice thing is it gives you recommendations. So if you've created a channel on YouTube, it'll recommend something else from your particular channel. So if someone's found their way to one video, then you'll be recommended another video from that same channel. And those will be on the top before other recommendations. So that's helped us as well. One thing David said that really caught me was that um, putting it that he got way more views just from people watching YouTube and looking for videos on YouTube than he got off of the Enneagram website where people would come, you know, the theoretically for right. this Enneagram right. content. So say a little bit more about choosing that YouTube venue. Well, I would just second everything that's been said. You know, I loved how beautiful Vimeo looked, but <laughs> No, almost no one was going to Vimeo and putting in key t keyword Enneagram or Enneagram type or personality type. Um, whereas if you went to YouTube, um, you know, tens of thousands of people were doing that. So it, it just was a numbers game. It was pretty simple um, to go with YouTube. And like everyone else, once we were able to post over 15 minutes on YouTube, we have an hour show that there was really no reason to, to do anything else. Um, so anyway, so I think, I mean, depending on what you're doing, I mean, I think if you're driving all your own traffic, you know, Vimeo, it's probably fine. It's a gorgeous player. Um, a lot of people use it for different reasons. We were on there for a while, uh, particularly when it, my original mindset was, okay, I've got all these people coming to my, my website already or Facebook. So, hey, Vimeo's gorgeous. They've got this HD thing. But the reality is far more people were going to YouTube looking for Enneagram than were going to my site looking for Enneagram, even though I'm ranked like number five in the world on Google for my site. <laughs> and YouTube still beat me out pretty substantially. So. And does anybody feel there's a difference that matters to them in the, the rights to the video that YouTube would claim versus Blip or Vimeo? Does that come up for anybody in this gathering? Um, I haven't had any problems with that. I mean, since we're basically giving away the product for free anyway, copyrights are not really a very big issue. But uh, we use YouTube also, and we do fairly well. And one of the advantages is that not just that people will go to YouTube and browse and find us, but that we also embed the videos in our own website. And I think we have a screen capture of the Future Talk website somewhere. Uh, so people who visit our website can see the YouTube videos directly from there. Also. Another source of traffic is that the guests who appear on the show uh, can drive the traffic. Sometimes they drive more traffic than we can. If they feel that the interview promotes their cause, they'll uh, embed the video on their site as well. And we get a lot of our hits like that. I know there's a lot of producers in this room. And uh, I, I think that what Martin said about your guests being uh, a key for how many, how many uh, views each show might get. We've seen that at the Media Center. One of the people in, in the room here produces a uh, annual thing about local heroes. And she does a short profile 
of each of these people in the community. Some of you might be local heroes. Is there a local hero in the room? Well, anyway, they're, they're <laughs> wonderful people. And they tend, these local heroes tend to have a lot of friends. And when we do, uh, you know what analytics are. That's when you're studying how many people watched a particular clip. We see that those local heroes shows really rock and roll. There's a lot of people that watch those clips. And what it amounts to is each of those people is a hub of their own bringing in their own friends and family and, and so forth. So they're doing PR for you, and it's so much, it's exponential, the number of views. Um, so I'm going to ask for more, uh, more of what social media has meant to you in terms of driving traffic. How do you use your blogs, your Facebook pages, your Twitters, and how do you keep from going crazy trying to keep on top of all that? So uh, say a little bit about using social media to drive traffic. Karen, you want to start? Yeah, it drives me crazy trying to keep <laughs> up, too. I, I, I use Twitter, and I use Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. Um, I, I, kind of, I have a, a little different approach, because I, I, what I've trying, been trying to do with the videos is to create a brand and develop a brand. And so I've been trying to develop this platform, which involves television, internet, radio, uh, print media, and uh, uh, public speaking. So I've created that platform and then using the videos to, to pull that all together. And it's been, it's been uh, really successful in that you know, I, I could get uh, viewers from you know, a radio show I may have done. Or, or um, something that uh, an article I've written in, in a magazine. So th that's worked for me. I'll move down the, the row here if you have something to say. Sure. I mean, I think, it, I think one of the things about social media is that it's, it sort of reverses how promotions work. You know, because I, I think when people think about using social media, I mean, it starts off with us sort of promoting our work. You know, we put it on Facebook and say we, we have a new film, and we hope you'll like it, and you know, watch the page, and we'll tell you updates. But really, when a film takes off is when you sort of reverse that. You know, when it's people who like your film start promoting it. You know, because if I get on Twitter and say, hey, I made this movie. It's great. You should watch it. Everybody goes, yeah, of course you think it's great. You should watch it. You know, it's like, you know, it's like when somebody's mom says, you know, hey, you should really date my daughter. It's like, yeah, I know you think she's great. But when you hear it from somebody else that goes, hey, I just saw this movie, you know, and it's going to be coming out, and I think it's really cool, and they go, oh, that guy kind of likes that movie. You know, I want to go check that out. And I think that's how it, you know, gets. So you want to really, your social media goal is to get other people excited about what you've got so that they share it with their friends, and then they share it with their friends. And until you can get to that threshold, you know, you're just, you know, screaming about your work and hoping somebody listens. Is there a, a technique to how to write a post so that other people amplify it? There is. There, you know, I mean, well, again, it helps if you have something unique to say, you know, because people don't want to feel cheated. So if you get them to look at your movie and then they go, this movie is just like that blockbuster movie that came out last year, so why do I care, you know? And then you can also target, you know. So I, I had a friend who made a, a short film called Pinball Donut Girl, which is about a girl that loves playing pinball machines, and she went out and met with a lot of pinball players and pinball collectors and got them to start promoting it. You know, and they, they love pinball, and they said, hey, there's this lady making this movie about pinball players, and they got excited, and they shared it with their friends. So it's, you know, it's a different technique depending on what your movie or what your show is, you know, what you, who you're trying to target. You, you find people that you think will be excited about your show and be willing to spread the word about it. I think the main thing about social media is that there's no way that you're going to be active in every single channel that there is. I mean, you pretty much have to pick your top two or three. Now, there are some things you can do of linking Facebook and LinkedIn to Twitter and things like that. But if you're going to replicate all of your content everywhere, you're never going to be making any more films. You're just going to not have time. So my recommendation would be figure out your central place where you want to p drive people to, whether that's your Facebook page, whether that's a blog, whether that's a website, and then point back at that place and have that be the one central place. And then when you do things like go out to Twitter or Facebook, then you can send teasers and get people to click back and see more of wherever that home page for you is. And then I would have to echo the whole value add, have something new to say. If you just retweet something, 
you're not adding your own value statement because, you know, for example, people that are on the show Toastmasters Pay to Bay, they don't just say, oh, the show's out, but hey, I'm at 10 minutes and 20 seconds and watch me here so that people put their own spin on it or I really liked X, Y, Z about it. So have something value added, don't just parrot it. So those would be the biggest recommendations that I could provide. Yeah, I would just real quickly, I would agree with everything that everyone has said. Uh, for us, what we find, we have a pretty good Facebook presence. We've got, I don't know, 1,800 and about the same on Twitter. And Pinterest for us, because we do a lot of visual stuff, has really taken off. And what I find is when we announce the shows um, on there, we get a nice spike. And we also have a big email list, but you got to do something after that spike. <laughs> because otherwise things will die off pretty quickly. So that's where I think a lot of the SEO or whether you want to purchase advertising comes in. And that's depending on why. The other question I have too is just each, each of us has a different reason for, for doing these videos. And so we want a different outcome. And so for us, you know, the videos are a credibility builder. And that's one of the most important things you can have on your website if you're trying to sell something. You've got to be able to establish credibility really fast. So for us, the videos are great because they're watched internationally and you know, they look pretty good and so all that kind of stuff. But um, anyway, we have, we have found that social media was great for that kind of first wave. But then to really keep the ball rolling, we had to look to other stuff. Well, we have a blog, and I have a Blogspot blog, and Blogspot is a blogging company that was acquired by Google a few years ago, and it's pretty easy to use. It's free, and it contains information about future talk and also other tidbits that might be of interest to people who would be interested in future talk, and it's linked to the website itself, so it gives people another reason to visit the website. You want to have your website uh, renewed sufficiently often that people feel whenever they visit it, they're going to see something they didn't see before. And uh, whether we always live up to that or not, that's the goal. We attempt to uh, uh, keep adding stuff so that people have more reasons to visit. And I, I'm just going to interject occasionally something you can use the Media Center for. And one of them is that we have a blog, and it's actually one of the more highly viewed pages on our website. And uh, if you're lucky enough, you can get Becky Saunders to write one about your <laughs> upcoming show. You could get me too, but her blogs are way more uh, readable. And, and that's another thing that you can use us for in addition to uh, using your own blog or finding other bloggers to talk about you. So I was very taken by... Uh, the pinball example that DC's friend <laughs> used because what she's doing is thinking about a particular show and what communities are tied into it already. If I can just reach this community and have them trust me, um, I've got a built-in sort of exponential builder, a viral, a viral stepping stone there. So I want to ask the panelists uh, how they uh, position themselves. I mean, we have a health show, we have the Enneagram show, we have a um, the uh, future talk is science oriented. How you look for communities uh, and leverage that in getting eyeballs? Who's going to start? Well, I think for future talk, one of the biggest selling points, which we mention in our program descriptions, is that the program is based in Silicon Valley and everybody in the world is very fascinated about what's going on in Silicon Valley. So basically, it's people who are interested in technology. And we produce, uh, well, we represent the program as being about ideas. We're always looking for ideas, not just what can technology achieve, but what do these achievements mean? How does it affect us in the long term and the short term? But do you get out to a particular mailing list? Do you leverage uh, your relationship with the tech museum? Uh, well, the Tech Museum underwrites the show. Uh, we haven't had the opportunity to work with them that much directly to where they're actively promoting it. Uh, we've done uh, one or two shows on the Tech Museum itself because they have some things that are going on there that are of interest. But so far, we've pretty much done it ourselves. Okay. And uh, there's a lot of things to be done, and you can't do them all. But we do what we can in the time we're willing to spend. 
So what piece of your success, David, is about this? Is there an Enneagram community out there? There is. I mean, I, that's one thing, too, is it's, I know each of you is, is sort of like a different use case in terms of what you want to do. Um, so I can just speak from our, my own, what we do. But basically, there's an international community of people that are fascinated with personality typing and what motivates people. And the Enneagram happens to be a very popular system right now. It's used in corporations and individuals use it and psychologists use it. And so for us, it was trying to establish ourselves in a very small niche, but there's a very active community. So the way we did that was, in terms of the video, was really to get our SEO in terms of the YouTube uh, professionally done. And um, that was incredibly helpful because what we found is that I think at this point, people have watched our videos from over 50 countries and we've had, we're approaching 80,000 views. So to, if you want somebody in Denmark to be able to go to YouTube and put in a, a, the key term Enneagram and have my show types your personality revealed show up, there's a lot of stuff you've got to do in terms of the SEO with YouTube to make sure that that's happening. And that's where, that, that's kind of what help, helped us the most. I mean, our goal with the show is basically to be able to use it as to internationally promote us because we do trainings and sell products and do coaching and all kinds of other stuff. So the show for us is sort of like a commercial. Um, and also we love the system and we like to get the information out there. When he so. says SEO, just in case anybody doesn't know, it's, it's the assumption that people that are really into some body of thought like Enneagram, they're going to be doing lots of searches on the internet that are, that are search terms related to Enneagram. And he wants to show up on those searches. And he's figured out unique ways that are different from searching, coming out high on a Google search to coming out high on a YouTube search. And we'll get some of those details later. So, Birgit? We've got actually two different audiences. I refer to it as internal and external. People who are already Toastmasters members, we've got about 5,000 plus members just in the Silicon Valley area. And not all of them have seen the show. So that's an internal audience that we can leverage. But externally, there are a lot of people that are afraid of public speaking. So that's who we're trying to approach when it comes to our external presence. So the, our website for this district is actually one of the top rated Toastmasters websites. Um, you know, it's up there with the Toastmasters.org for the international organization. So that website has helped us. Again, it's where is our audience going to be in Silicon Valley. Uh, if we're looking for new members, it's, they're really going to be on social media. Uh, probably more Facebook than MySpace, for example, if you just look at the demographics. So that's really helped us there. And part of this whole thing of writing for the Mountain View patch is also to, to drive awareness. So we can point to our videos, but we're also providing a value-added service. And actually, this past show, we're going back to those educational routes to provide some really short speaking tips, two to three minutes, that'll help people. And then they'll see an example of a really well-presented show. So that way, we're adding a service and showing people how they can get over their biggest fear, probably bigger, bigger than most fears. And then from there, uh, they can get a couple of tics and tips and tricks, which will then help, help get them back into the whole Toastmasters fold. So that's the idea behind it. Mm -hmm. I think for, uh, for our short films, we, we would go after a specific target. So uh, one of my last films was a 3D black and white silent film. And I wanted to attract the kind of audiences that would be into that. So we actually did some Facebook campaigns. When we were at a film festival in a particular area, we did very targeted campaigns where we would go after particular demographics. And I went after women of a particular age because they, I felt like, are more likely to be into nostalgic films. And this is a, it's a romance film. And, uh, and I got really good hits. So I would go after women of a particular age in that area that had listed that they were interested in films or short films or silent films. And Facebook allowed me to kind of target them for my audience. you know, And, and the ads would come up. And we got a lot of clicks off that. And I actually, you know, went to the film festival and I had a couple of people come up and say, yeah, you know, I, I saw your film festival or I saw your film on a Facebook ad and it looked interesting and I came out to see it. So we had some pretty good success with that. But uh, it is expensive to do that way, you know. So for a short film, for me, ultimately, it's, you know, I'm not looking to sell it. So really, I'm, I'm paying to get people to, to be my friend, which is, it's really expensive. <laughs> 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 so. Karen, did you want to add anything? 
Well, as, as far as uh, the health reporter and what I'm doing, I, I spend a lot of time building relationships, you know, personal relationships, whether they're news directors, because my, my uh, ideal, my initial objective was to get it on, like a little piece in a, in a news show. Um, so that's what I've been doing. I'm in, very involved with the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, uh, working with a lot of the news directors and producers, so relationships and, and doctors. And um, it, uh, when I interview a doctor, and then he, he'll put that out on his website and, and talk to his patients about it. And, and, and so it's, mine is more personal, not so much as, you know. But it's goal. that leveraging right. of right. other people involved in the show. Yes. Um, I know a lot of people in the room raise their hands about money. Now, I didn't see any of the panelists step out of a limo <laughs> when they came here in the parking lot, so I don't know what answers we're going to get, but is anybody using their site in a way that has brought them some income? Anybody on the panel? I mean, for Toastmasters, it's a nonprofit organization, so I would have to say no to that. Uh, we're just trying to raise the awareness and, and do some public relations with it, and again, going back to giving people the experience of being on TV. So for us, no. But I guess with David, just there is a connection. Yeah, there's definitely a connection. I mean, obviously, our the arrangement with the grant with the media center is that we cannot monetize the videos, which we don't. But the videos have become a wonderful way for us to get out there what we do. And if you talk to, you know, consultants and stuff, they will tell you that with your website, to come back to that word, a credibility builder is so important. So. If you um, are, you know, whatever, you're doing health stuff or whatever, films, you've got to somehow establish that credibility really fast. So for us, it's been you know, just a wonderful way to um, do that and to be able to do it relatively inexpensively. And it's been amazing to us to see, you know, people watching these videos in 50 countries. I mean, that's just crazy to me. Um, to see, you know, you go in there, I think Denmark is like number three. It's like, who would have thought that? <laughs> But there's actually a huge Enneagram community in Denmark, but YouTube reaches that. So for us, it's just been a really great way to sort of give people a taste of what we do. And also in our community to kind of give back to that community and to say we want to support it and, you know, we want to have good information out there. So. And anyone else want to add something about revenues? Yes, Karen. I, uh, my, my videos were being used uh, by an advertising, a national advertising company, and they were using it as a pre-roll to an ad. So um, that was, that worked out well. Good. Yeah. And um, I just published it on Kindle, so I don't know if that's the blog, my blog, um, and maybe that might generate some, some income, but because very, very ads. small. Because of the ads that are put onto the blog site, right? I don't have any ads on my blog. Oh, so how would you get money from Kindle? Uh, because it's uh, you can actually um, go to Kindle and and download the the blog. Oh, so the so blo that you blog would be for pay. Yeah, so you don't need uh, the the objective is you don't need Wi-Fi to read the the blog. Do people purchase any of the short films? Do you see? Yeah, there are ways to sort of monetize short films, but you know I think I think uh, what the previous point is. You know, as a short filmmaker, your goal is to build credibility as a filmmaker. You know, so trying to monetize your film through a distributor is actually is probably one of the worst things you can do as a short filmmaker. And I and I didn't think about this. For me, I, I thought it was like you know, kind of be great to get distribution, and then I can claim to be a big shot. And I actually I got approached by about six distributors now who have wanted to distribute the film for money. And uh, but I talked to other filmmakers, and they said, you know, if you think about it, if you if you sell your movie, you know, maybe 50 people will see it. And maybe you'll make ten dollars, you know. But if you keep it for free on something like YouTube or you know public media, you're going to get way more exposure, and that's what you want as a filmmaker. You want people to see your work and go, "Hey, I really like that guy. You know, I think he could be the next Tim Burton or whatever," and uh, and start following your work. So, so I think you know by as, at least if you're making short films, if you try to get distribution, you're really going to limit who sees your film. I and mean, I'm a short filmmaker. I don't own any DVDs of short films. I just don't buy them. I just watch content online for free. So I think it's better to keep your stuff free. And you can certainly try to monetize through YouTube, you know, a little bit if people start going to your, you know, you start getting thousands of hits and there's the ads on YouTube, they can certainly share some. But I would not advise anyone to try to shell, you know, sell their short films. And so 
going back to getting eyeballs on your videos, a couple of, of our panelists have mentioned taking out ads on either Facebook or Google. And I want to just delve a little bit more into those details because sometimes it's expensive for what you, you're measuring, what you really want to get. And other times it's turned out to be a pretty good bargain. So um, I know, David, you had some thoughts about that. And why don't you share them? Well, again, I, I'm in a very specific niche. So this may or may not apply to any others. But uh, two things. One, I do find that Facebook is quite expensive, as I think you said, DC. Uh, however, for us, I found that our competitors were not advertising on YouTube. So I was able to bid on YouTube ads very inexpensively. And initially, that was just a great way to boost our traffic on YouTube. So depending on what you're doing, it may find that it's a very broad subject and it's really expensive and it's not worth it. But you may find that there's a way to use a key term where it's inexpensive. So I would just encourage you to check it out because it was, uh, it was a surprise to me. Um, because I was so used to the sort of the high, you know Google AdWords or Facebook that stuff, I was used to a pretty expensive. It was, it was much too expensive for us to pay that just to have somebody to watch a video for free. But the YouTube price was actually quite low. Yes, the Media Center has experimented some with Facebook ads and Google ads, and that it's uh, like David said about YouTube ads. It's based on a bidding algorithm, so that uh, the same search term that you're bidding for or the interest that, like these women in certain parts of the country who have an interest in short films, uh, can be more or less expensive by the day, depending on who else is bidding for that search term or that demographic. And it turns out Facebook friends are pretty expensive um, for what you get out of them. Uh, so I, I'm being facetious, but it, the ads do work, but um, I'm not sure it'll get you what you want. And um, What about tags? Let's talk about uh, tagging our media when we put them online. What good does that do for you? Who can talk about tagging? Well, it, it goes back to the whole search engine optimization. And, and there, are actually, Google provides some services that are actually not paid for, where you can actually put in um, what you are thinking about tagging. And the, the other thing is we're usually, sh usually very shy about, oh, we should only do one or two tags. No, just uh, explode it. Because there is public speaking, public speaking tips, public speaking skills, fear of public speaking. And you can actually put uh, your, those words into a tool within Google, and it'll tell you where most of the hits are. So that's actually really good information, whether you use that for your website or YouTube or your blogs. Um, it's good information so that you can know, well, there are a lot of hits on public speaking. But the thing is, you might want to hone that down a little bit more. You want to get down to a lower level of detail eventually, because if everything comes up and is, ta is tagged public speaking, you're not going to be unique again. So you still want to have that in combination with something that's pretty unique to your audience. And all goes back to what is your audience? What are they using? What are they looking for? So there's got to be some target segmentation that happens there. But definitely that tool has been very valuable. A lot of people look for this. Almost nobody looks for that. So don't waste the tag on, on something that nobody looks for. So that's been really key. And that's been a, a really good tool to just see what does Google say today in terms of what is on the top of the hit list, so to speak. Any other tagging gems? I, I will just give you a, a quick one that really turned things around for us pretty dramatically. On YouTube, you've got sort of three areas to describe what you're doing. You've got your title, your description, and then your tags. So our show is called Types, Your Personality Revealed. I, we chose that title because not everyone knows what the Enneagram is. The Enneagram is just the name of a personality typology. So I called our first show in the title on YouTube. I put something like Types Your Personality Revealed in the Enneagram TV show. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. I can say it's a TV show. And uh, the guy that Mark Robertson, who runs uh, realseo.com, which I highly recommend you follow his blog. It's R-E-E-L-S-E-O.com to give him a plug. But um, anyway, he's got lots of good tips. And that'll kind of get you into that whole world. But he looked at what we were doing, and he said, oh, nope, you can't do it this way. You've got to put Enneagram first, 
everywhere. That key term for us had to be at the top of the title, it had to be at the start of the description, and it had to be at the start of the tag. And like you were saying, every permutation of that in the tags. So I had to come up with a way to say Enneagram, so, I, so instead of any types or personality revealed, I finally came up with Enneagram experts discuss types, you know, personal, et cetera. And then, because what you're having to do is to learn how to think like YouTube, the way its algorithms think. <laughs> And it, it's going to weight whatever you put first in your tagging as higher than what's downstream from that. So even if I were to put Enneagram three words down, that's not as powerful as starting the title with the term Enneagram. So something as simple as that was huge for us in terms of rewriting all the tags for our video, the descriptions and the titles. And then over a period of many months, combined with a, an ad campaign, eventually took us from the basement you know, to the top in terms of the organic search results, which is really where you want to be because I don't think anybody here, you know, wants to pump in, you know, $10,000 a month into ads <laughs> online, <laughs> which you could easily do. Um, so you've got to get real smart about the organic part of it, you know, how, like you're saying, like, you know, use keyword search recommendations and stuff. But that tip alone was, was huge for us, and it's a common mistake that people don't put that single keyword right at the very top. Yeah. Ellie. Can we bring a mic over here? And while we're doing it, can we bring up the website from the Media Center's website, uh, the page on the media that shows the different producers? Um, I, go ahead and ask real quick. I have a question. So you're saying on every YouTube uh, video that posts, you put the Enneagram all through it? Okay. Yeah, well, not only all through it, it has to be at the beginning of every section where I can describe the show. It's literally the first word. We're down to our last minute, so I'm going to need to, uh, where were you when I asked for questions <laughs> from the audience? <laughs> I said at any time, stand up and ask. So what we'll do is we'll stay later, and we will answer every question that comes up. I don't care if we have to be here three days. So, we'll do it. Uh, but what I want to show is the, uh, the page on our website that shows producers that when they uh, get a new video online, they can contact us at the Media Center, me, and we will update your page up on the Media Center site to include your latest videos. I want to extend a really big thank you to our panelists who gave their evening up to share some tips and thoughts with you tonight, and, I, and to our audience that came and spent some extra homework time, because I know you're all producing and to our crew who volunteered their special time this evening to make this show possible. So from the Mid-Peninsula Community Media Center, uh, I want to say goodbye and thank you for watching. <laughs>